Works Program, and then in 2017, we uh, received matching dollars uh, from the federal government so that we had $90 million. So we're working very hard right now to extend that money, um, and hopefully there will be some announcements of that, uh, of that short. So it's um, so next we're gonna I'm gonna walk you through some of the statistics um, around like so to contextualize the housing market a bit here we touched on it um, Mayor Health touched on it um, Minister Fleming touched on it but I think I want to dive a little bit deeper so and this is a tendency of mine as a researcher first and foremost is to uh, is to really look at the evidence so because um, one of the um, models that we have in the department that I now oversee in the BC Nonprofit Housing Association is what gets measured gets done. So let's measure this and let's quantify the need and let's get done. Let's get it done. So can you go to the next one, please? Thank you. So um, as you can see <laughs> on this graph, and so I'm going to kind of walk in front of it a little bit and, uh, and I can, I'll slow down. Um, but what you can see is like a, a very uh, a trajectory of increasing uh, uh, average selling price by housing type in the capital region. So we started in 1998, went around 100,000. Pretty much not a lot of difference between a single detached home, condominiums, and townhouses. And then we get to 2002, 2006, and 2008, we see a huge spike. And then around 2014, 2016, and another huge spike. I think uh, Murray touched on this. It was uh, an increase of only like 380% over this time period, which is outstanding. This is like that's un unspeakable. <laughs> so, um, so we'll see. So, you know, land has gone up. There were a few things that were happening historically right now. Uh, during this period. One of the things I just want to touch, up, touch on is something called the financialization of the housing market. What that means is that people started using housing as a commodity that was traded on the market, as opposed to something that was uh, an investment, a lifetime investment to house your family. And so the whole notion of land and housing shifted. We had, um, and we also had policies that really um, were also favoring home ownership at this time as well. So there's a lot of different things happening um, during this period of time. Uh, and now we get to uh, right around today where your average selling price for a single detached home is $859,000. So let's look at monthly rent then, shall we? So. Uh, a similar type of trajectory as uh, housing costs go up and the market increases. We also saw an increase in the average rent. So, what a tight rental market does, and this is so. This also plays in with the uh, vacancy rate. And I have that in a slide. What it means is that it's a land, it's a landlord's market. So, from a renter's perspective, right? So, landlords can increase rent if we don't have policies in place to. To, to mitigate that, to, to shape it a little bit, to make it more friendly for renters, we see these kinds of conditions happen. And so, um, so you know, going from 2006, for the average rent for a two bedroom was $875 a month, um, went up to $1,288 a month. So that's a significant increase in terms of cost. And if you're a single parent family, and you need to, that's, a, that's, a, that's a quite a lot of extra money a year to be able to have the fund, like to, to raise in order to have a stable place to live. Please do. Yeah. Steve and I are going to do this probably the whole time. Yeah, I just wanted to say, and also these are the average market rent, so that includes, when we're looking at these, it includes social housing in that. It also includes uh, people that have been living in the same residence for 25 years where there aren't the same ability to raise, uh, raise the rents. So when we talk about average market rents, it doesn't mean that's what you're going to be renting for if you're currently entering the rental market. Uh, because those prices are much higher. And so what we're seeing for one bedrooms right now is much closer to 1350, 1400 for a one bedroom. We're looking at you know closer to 1800 or $2,000 for a two bedroom and over $2,000 for a three bedroom if you're going to enter the market. But these are the current average rents when you're looking at it holistically. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Christine. 
So this is what our rate, uh, vacancy rates have looked like across the region over the last 10 years or so. And, oh no, actually starting from 1990 um, to 2017. So a balanced market, we consider a balanced market when you have a 3% vacancy rate. That means that if you need to move, you can. You can find a unit that fits your needs and there's space in the market to be able to do that. However, in 1990 we started, we had a vacancy rate of 0.3%. We now have a vacancy rate of 0.7%. And although we have some like variability across, we had a recession in here, right? Um, and we had another bit of a recession around here. We still see that historically our vacancy rates show that there is a need for more affordable housing stock. And we heard earlier that the, the lack of investment from senior levels of government really had a profound effect on that. So let's take a look at the inventory we're talking about stock. So the, re the region has a variety of housing types available, and the majority being ownership and ground oriented, which means that those are your detached, your single detached homes. Okay? Um, and these are, um, there are substantial options for rental housing beyond the purpose of built rental housing stock as well. So what you'll see here is, and this is based on uh, 2016 census data, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation Rental Market Report and uh, BC Housing Subsidized Housing Portfolio. So this includes uh, social housing and um, units as well as market rent, market rental, and uh, ownership as well. So we'll see that this is what our stock looks like for ownership. <clears throat> so we do have some rental um, in these kinds of orient oriented uh, units, so single detached townhouse, row or duplexes. It makes up a small portion of the rental market. Um, and you'll see uh, in our supply, you'll see that our condo units are kind of creeping up as well. When you look at the rental market as a whole, we, we look at two things. We look at the primary rental market, we look at the secondary rental market. The primary rent rental market is purpose-built rental housing. So you know, all along like Cook Street, Off Court Street, all of those, um, those, those walk-up buildings, those are all people consider purpose-built rentals. They were, they were built to, to rent. Um, but we have this growing secondary rental market too that almost makes up almost 50% of the entire rental market. These are basement suites. These are condos that are being rented. They're generally more expensive, um, you know, single detached homes that are for rent too. So the secondary market is also pretty significant in terms of our supply. Uh, next slide, So, we look at supply, we, we, appear, we have a deficiency. That's pretty obvious in terms of rental housing. So, let's look at housing start. So, over the past 10 years, um, there were a lot of ownership, I mean, ownership was like where we were building, right? So, condominiums, not as many single detached homes, but definitely more condos, um, and you can look at, so rent as a percent, so rental as a percent of the total, you see starting in 2006, it was only about 2% of all housing starts. So anything that was being started to be built was only 2% were for rental housing. But, <coughs> we look up over here, and we've actually, it's been increased to 41%. So close to almost half now, is um, is rental housing starts. Um, and we'll start seeing those units kind of coming online in the next three or four years, right? It takes about three or four years to actually, um, from beginning to end, uh, build the units, right? So anyway, we're seeing an increase, but you can see that it's still pretty minimal all the way across, and we have a backlog that we need to, to address. And we're hopefully, as we start building more rental, that will happen. Thank you. So again, just to reiterate my point, <laughs> um, so this is housing starts by intended market, right? So ownership, freeholder, ownership, condominium, and rental. So again, these are the two ownership lines, and then you'll see rental really wasn't happening at all uh, until quite recently. And I believe that a lot of that rental was actually being built in the city of Victoria. <laughs> so part of what is, Part of what is uh, meeting the supply challenge, I mean, affordability is, is an issue, but we also are seeing um, 
total, well, we're seeing migration into the capital region, right? People are coming here for work. They're also leaving other communities looking for affordability. Um, just want to take a step back a little bit. Our organization runs something called the Canadian Mental Housing Index. And that's based on 2016, our recent one is based on 2016 census data. What that actually showed to us, it showed to us two things that we weren't expecting. One was that um, people are chasing affordability outside of the urban areas. So we're actually seeing an increase in uh, housing costs as people from more expensive areas are moving because the market is shifting to accommodate them, right? So we're seeing this like spread of affordability challenges in a much larger area, geographic area, than we had seen previously. We also saw, for the first time in Canadian history, the number, the growth rate of renter households, so the number of renter households exceeding, this is just in terms of growth rate, not numbers, exceeding the number of people who are becoming homeowners. So that means that we actually have to really address the supply issue, right? This is for the first time in Canadian history that we've seen that growth change. So migration into the region is definitely playing a part, but a lot, as we know, and those of you who are familiar with um, the work that we've done here around homelessness, we know that a lot of people experiencing homelessness are actually from here, right? So as, as although we have migration and things are, you know, folks are moving into the area, we also have some really like home from affordability issues as well that we need to be mindful of. Poor housing need. So this is like, let's, we're looking at now the depth, the challenges of affordability. What does it actually look like for a renter household? So I'm gonna speed up my presentation here because the researcher I find is all very interesting and I can talk about numbers you can imagine, but um, I'll, I'll speed it up a little bit. What this actually shows us is that we just we, we see that more renters experience poor housing need. Poor housing need means you spend more than 30% of your income on shelter costs. That number of people who are experiencing that affordability crunch keeps growing every year. This is just a nice little uh, graphs that show you what that actually looks like. So. Um, the rate for renters, almost 50% of renters are paying more than 30% of their income, household income on shelter costs. Um, and then we, just, we have some, some statistics here around what, what are the household characteristics of these, of these renter households. So we have a high uh, a number of low parent families uh, who are in poor housing needs, single person households, um, <clears throat> pardon me, and other non-family households, indigenous people, like I had mentioned at the beginning, um, face a disproportionately higher levels of homelessness in our region, nearly 33% um, who shared with us doing our research um, that they had an indigenous ancestry. Um, uh, they were experiencing homelessness. If we compare that to the general population, um, indigenous people only make up about 14% of the population here in Greater Victoria and they're experiencing homelessness at a much higher rate. So again, um, this is something that we, is, is possible and, and uh, we need to address. Next slide. Okay, we're getting it to the end of May and then I'm gonna put it over to Christine. But what I think what's important is when we start talking about housing and supply and need, we think about what the spectrum is. So this used to be referred to as the continuum. This was an idea that you know, you move kind of along the continuum, kind of like in your life course, right? Well, we know that that's actually not the case because it just doesn't work out that way. So we, look, we started calling it the spectrum, okay? So we have emergency shelter here, um, and then we have the market, uh, market home ownership. So when we talk about supply, and our members, the BC Nonprofit Housing Association, are in here. We're all the non, we represent all the non-market housing. And increasingly, we're gonna need to be spending more investment here. It's happening, but we need to be really gonna need more investment. Our organization estimated, well actually, let me see if that works. Next slide, please. Okay, um, this shows what our shortfall unit is. So for folks, uh, for households that have a, a we have a unit shortfall of 10,000 units. So we 
need around 10,000 units to uh, provide housing for households that make a below $20,000 a year. Um, and for households between twenty dollars and $35,000 a year, 6,800 unit shortfall. And, and, it, and it goes up, so, and then uh, low to moderate. This is all in relation, so ask me later about the methodology, and I will, I can board you uh, on a one-on-one basis -on -one <laughs> about how we did this calculation. <laughs> um, but the unit shortfall for low to moderate uh, incomes are uh, about 2,700 units. So we were able to quantify um, what, what our actual shortfall is here. And uh, looking at our targets and demand estimates, again, just, just a table that really, really reiterates uh, the number of units that we need to address need. Um, and our total estimated rent and demand is 34,000 units. And over to Chris. Um, 
Homelessness, again, is an issue for the Union of BC Municipalities, and then better coordination, and, and they call it an all-government approach uh, to housing. So then we're at the local level, and you see that we're starting to talk about coordination. Uh, because when you're at the local level and you're on the ground, you really see what needs to happen in order to um, solve, solve the issue. So the municipalities are calling for better coordination, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So the next one. And then I was saying that we uh, just updated our regional health and affordability strategy. Um, and we have five uh, what we call mutually dependent goals. And that's it. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you, I'm <laughs> Looks like you got it. <laughs> That's only a pulling the plug on it. So, <laughs> we, have, we have mutually dependent goals, and again, it's, it's about the same, we're talking about the same issues. So, we want to build the right supply of housing, we want to take a whole government approach to housing, uh, we want to increase rental housing, we want to eliminate homelessness, and these are all, uh, again, it's across, uh, all of the same themes are across all plans. So what does that mean exactly? How are we actually going to have an impact in solving uh, affordable housing, the affordable housing crisis? And I think that one of the most important things, and we'll bring the numbers up in just a moment, is like Marika said before, we need to measure, we need to measure what the need is, we need to agree on targets, and then we need to meet those targets. And everything that we do has to all align in order to meet those targets. So when we're developing policies, when we're developing legislation, when we're developing regulatory tools, they all have to align to meet the targets. Because what we've seen is what we've been doing over the last 20 years has, been meet, has not been meeting the needs of the people that are actually living in our communities. And so, but beyond that, sorry, I don't have my thing, so now I'm going to just speak at all. <laughs> so that's number one. So everything that we do has to meet the needs of the targets. And what we know is that the housing that has been built has not been built for those people that are most vulnerable in our communities. And what we now also know is that for those people that are living in middle income situations, the housing is also not being built for them. And we have a shortage for, it's now beyond what we used to see, which was really those people that are in those most vulnerable, we're also, we also have a shortage for everybody uh, living between 55 and 80,000. Housing has now become unaffordable. And 80,000 is what our median income, house, median household income is in the region. And not only for renter households, but also for people that own their own homes. And this, uh, and, and so, as we move forward, we have to look at how we're going to actually meet the needs of everyone within that uh, within that uh, that part of our that household income in our community. We keep moving forward. So the city of Victoria also has a housing strategy, and again, you can see that, uh, that they're also focused on the same goals around increasing supply of housing, um, encouraging the diversity of housing types, including tenures and prices in the city, and then building awareness. And so you see that it shifts a little bit because this is really targeted at solutions when you look at it from the city level because they know what they need to do in order to actually make it happen within their, within their, uh, their government structure. We can go to the next one. So I already said this, but it was around establishing our, lo our, uh, our local housing action plans and our strategies that support and meet the identified housing targets. So if we go to the next, there we go. So, this was the, the, what we talked about with Marika. Uh, we want to be able to reach these goals. So as part of our regional housing affordability strategy, as Marika said earlier, what we noted is that the migration and the in-migration within Victoria has shifted. So historically, our housing stock has made up about 63%. It's, it's different in Victoria, it's about 50-50, but in the region, it's about 63% home ownership and 37% rental. And now that's shifting. About 80% of the people that are moving into Victoria or are moving around Victoria are choosing rental housing. And 
So our our shift we have we have a shift to to a need to build more affordable rental housing. Okay, another another issue that we have. Um, wait, actually, can we go back to the last slide? So I just want to talk a lot about a few of the issues and the challenges with building affordable housing. Um, to build affordable housing and to build housing, if we're talking about housing at these rent levels, there has to be at least 50% of the housing has to be paid for through grants. There's no other way that we can actually reach the affordability level unless there's some sort of infusion of funds that is going to bring the, uh, the cost of the uh, financing for the housing down to that level. So we need about 50%. So there has to be government intervention in order for us to be able to reach these housing levels. In the city of Victoria, it costs between $275,000 to $325,000 at least to build a unit of housing. And that's in a multi-unit residential complex. So in order to do that, we need to be able, we need to have government investment in that housing to reach those, those housing levels, those, sorry, those rent levels. And right now, we do have an upswing of rental housing that's being built. However, right now the interest rates are going up and the uh, cost of building is going up. Um, but what's really going to impact it is the interest rates. In the last few months, we've seen the interest rates go up three times and we're expecting the same thing next year. And when you're talking about you know, 0.25 or 0.5%, that can add a couple of million dollars to, uh, to the cost of building housing. And so when we're looking at things like zoning processes or um, uh, development processes at the municipal level, one way that we can create affordability is to ensure that those processes are faster so, so that we aren't impacted by the, uh, by the interest rate changes that happen throughout that process. Um, let's recap. Uh, protect and maintain existing non-market housing. So over the years, another thing that they didn't invest in is protecting our housing. <laughs> so we were given uh, you know, minimal amounts of uh, replacement reserve funding in order to uh, protect our, uh, our housing stock. And, uh, and so we've unfortunately, our, our housing stock has a um, significant amount of deferred maintenance that needs to be done. Um, there has been investment from the federal government and the provincial government, uh, but right now it's not enough and it's difficult to access. Um, we need to implement regulations and incentive programs that preserve and protect existing rental housing. And we also have to strengthen legislation to protect tenants, which is what has been going on uh, currently. Um, but you know, I, and I know that this is a challenging conversation, but sometimes we do have to do redevelopment within our housing stock. Um, there, it is too expensive uh, to fix the housing stock, and it would be better for us because we, uh, we, uh, we see that we can increase the number of units. Um, but I think that it's really important that as we do that, that we do it responsibly and that we ensure that we are creating the same number of rent here to income units or low uh, income units so that people can move back into the community and still afford it. Um, and then with homelessness, um, and I'm going to speed up too because I'm talking too much. <laughs> but there are two things. One is we do have to increase the supply, but we also have to look at our systems. And when we talk about a whole government approach, uh, we can't just talk about all levels of government, we also have to talk about across ministries um, because there's a lot of ministries that have to be involved in order to uh, prevent homelessness from happening in the first place and also to support uh, people that are currently home homeless. Um, so we have to have better coordination of our ministries um, in order to support those folks who are right now experiencing homelessness. Um, And, and the last one is create a community understanding. So it's really important that when we're going through the local planning processes, uh, that we're only talking about the housing that we're developing. When I go and I present a proposal um, to a community, more often than not I'm talking about the people that I'm housing rather than the design. 
And if I were to go forward with just a rental housing or a condo development, people aren't asking me about the people that are going to be living there. And I think that we have to remember that, you know, it's everybody. It's everybody in our community. When we're looking at those incomes and we say that that's a moderate income is 80000 and I'm housing those people that are at that moderate income because I'm trying to create affordable housing, these are our neighbors that we're talking about. And if someone was going to buy a house in a community, no one could discriminate against them when they went to purchase that house. But when we're in the planning process, people often want to talk about who's going to move in there. And I think that we have to discourage that kind of conversation, and we have to start... Crystal will take any questions that you'd like to ask. Uh, is the mayor still here? Did Lisa have to go? You got it? Okay, so we'll get you if I could. I'd like to know more about those small houses that you tantalizingly put up. Is that something that would require major rezoning in the city of Victoria? Is that a real co contributor to rental stock, for example? The, the, the tiny homes? Do you yeah. know the tiny homes? Yeah. So um, the city of Portland just made it legal uh, about a month and a half ago for people to build uh, tiny homes on wheels and move them home into, move them into backyards. And they included RVs in that. It's not, a, it's not a permanent solution. And then the city of Los Angeles copied Portland. And so uh, there have been a lot of people lobbying us um, at the city to to allow, again, not for everyone. And there's some people who feel claustrophobic, there's some people who can't live in tiny homes, there's some people who don't want to live in tiny homes. But from across the spectrum, from people who are homeless to um, you know women in their 50s and 60s who don't have large pensions, who want a place to live in our city neighborhoods. So all we need to do uh, is change the rules so that in any backyard in the city of Victoria, a tiny home will be allowed. And because we can put it as part of zoning, we can cap the rents at $500 a month. So that's something that I'm going to ask council to consider um, very soon. Thank you. about the housing stock that was available in the chart to show the different levels. Yeah. But the reality with that chart is that the people in the upper levels don't suffer because when their when their housing stock is not enough, then they just go to the next level down. And everyone goes next level down. But the people at the bottom level, people like me who live with disability and social housing, I live beside people who have Mercedes and, and fast racing motorbikes and like multiple vehicles. And I, I'm, I'm actually being thrown out now onto the street on where technicality or I won't go to the lid. But anyway, so that being said, the priority has to stop being on this idea of taking care of everything and whatever. That's like trickle down economics in a polite way to mention. What we need to do is we need to address the, the, the real crisis, the people in that bottom rung who, what their shortest means that they are homeless. The other ones didn't mean homeless. They were all the same color on the chart, but they mean homeless. So those people, we need to treat it the same way we treat the Fort McMurray fire. People from provinces all across Canada donated to help those people who were all insured, covered by Red Cross, by government donations, yet we still donated money to them, yet we have people in our own city who don't. So if we can house the people in a fire situation, in a crisis situation, we can house our homeless people, people now, not in 10 years now, and then we'll take care of the rest of it. One thing is that the supply programs that were recently introduced by the provincial government are looking at those uh, 
those folks that are most vulnerable. So there really is a focus yeah. on... What, what we hear, and what we hear all this meeting is we heard looking at and studying. No, no I, it's, it's there, a fire I, I, now, I anticipate it's that there's going to be announcements yeah. like in the next week. Yeah, this isn't yeah. a new idea. Hi, um, my name's Leslie and I'm a volunteer with a group called the Victoria Tenant Action Group. And anyone who's here, uh, if you want to sign up and receive information, you've got a table at the back. And what I want to say is I've heard a lot today, a lot of very good news and a lot of encouraging news from different levels of government. But government alone cannot solve the housing crisis. And I've worked as a housing advocate for four decades. And what I see in Victoria that is unique to, to my experience is a, what feels like a total lack of inclusion of the people who are going to live in the housing in the development, the design, and the management of the housing. And so we get a lot of top-down charitable type models of housing. And the Victoria Coalition on Homelessness will identify that there's a whole lot of social housing where people move in and they move out. Or worse, they move in and they die of an overdose in their apartment. And I heard something very wise at a community consultation from a woman who had, who had lived in and survived residential school. And she said, if you look around at our institutions, there, there are two factors that are a replication of colonization. And those factors are isolation and control. And if you use isolation and control to house people, you will be replicating colonization. You will be doing nothing for the people who live in that housing. And we've, we've seen it here where a group, the Portland Hotel Society in Vancouver did a very good job of developing the Portland Hotel with the people that lived in the Portland Hotel. They got parachuted into Victoria and it's a nightmare. So I really want to encourage all of the housing programs to not just talk about levels of government working together, but actually include people. We, li we all live somewhere, and we don't live alone. We live in new communities and neighborhoods. And when you go to city council, you hear all kinds of homeowners having lots of input and lots of opportunity to talk about their neighborhoods. I've been a tenant all my life. And I live in a great big apartment building of 80 apartments. And anything that is done to develop community in my apartment building is done by the tenants who live in the building. So community, developing community and giving community true, a true role in housing is is imperative. Thank you for hearing me. I just want to acknowledge your comments and thank you very much. I couldn't agree with you more. I think that actually one of the ways that we're we're going to see these investments actually happen is if we actually work deeply in community, um, because we actually have to be meeting the needs of people who will need the housing. And we can't do that without those voices included. We just, we can't. I, I first, that's my personal opinion, but I, I agree with you. Thank you for raising that issue. Thank you. Um, I'm very, very pleased to hear uh, some of the initiatives that have been, that have been uh, talked about today. I think it's very encouraging. But I do, I do wonder um, whether the um, uh, housing affordability issue can really be uh, addressed in any serious way. Uh, as long as housing is used as a vehicle for speculation. And I know that there's a tendency to think that this has to, this is, you know, uh, to point at foreigners or, you know, uh, operatives or whatever, you know, <laughs> coming here and, 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 and uh, causing the price, the, price, the price of housing to go up. But really, it's everyone, uh, everyone who's in the housing market is effectively doing so by um, uh, leveraging their income to the highest extent to, to raise housing prices. You know, I appreciate the political difficulty uh, of even addressing this issue because no one wants to, to say that this is going to come to a stop. But I fear that without um, um, some type of control on the way that house prices are rising, we'll never be able to get a grip on this. Uh, we're going to end up with the social profile of Argentina if this continues. And it's, it's a threat to the economy too. We, we don't even need the, the level of ownership that we've got to have a successful economy. Germany, 60% of the population rents. It's a far more competitive economy than ours. So, um, at the same time, I, I, when we see the very modest steps that the provincial government has taken to try to, to, to tamp down speculation a bit and the howls of outrage, so I, I don't know uh, politically uh, how possible it is to even uh, bring up this issue, and yet I don't. I, I, I'm asking you: Do you think it's even possible 
uh, in the long run to deal with this without controlling the rise in house prices? Um, I'll just I'll make one comment. Um, I think it's totally possible because policy decisions are decisions that we actually consciously make. And so it's like minimum wage, it's like changing, changing zoning. It's like any policy decision is actually, it's a conscious decision that we make. So we, we can, right? We have the tools and the mechanisms to be able to do that. Um, but it's about the will to actually do that, right? And so we need to apply that pressure to actually make that happen. So we can actually, we, what, what, I mean, what, what, we need policies in place that really actually um, un, unhinge or, or remove housing off the market, right? We need, we need some deep interventions and those are policy interventions to make that happen. Or else I completely agree with you. We have an untenable situation. So we can't actually continue to have housing on the market as we do. I, I, I agree. But we have to actually make, make, we have to have those conscious policy interventions happen. So, but I think we can. I think we can. I'm hopeful that way. I realize that all these graphs must be uh, attended to, to in order to make the decisions that you do make. However, I have some experience that I haven't heard mentioned in a small potato. I wrote it out and uh, it takes me about three minutes. I try it and I ask you to listen. If it's no good, it's no good, but it might bring a different perspective in places. It was a long, long time ago, but I remember that our present Prime Minister's father had an apartment building built which had specific accommodation for families at a reduced rental, which were all located on the lower level. Very sensible, I thought, especially for the children. I recall also that there was a bit of fuss up at first, but in the main it was successful. I also think that after a few years, these suites reverted to the builders, that is, the owners. Good for them, or bad for us. I uh, certainly, if I had been in that position, I would to be kicked out. Where do they go? What do they do? They're back to the same position. I do not have a computer, so I leave it to somebody else to check it out. The building was on Broad Street, toward the south end. Because of the backlash of 10 to 50 percent of all units, some portion of the way it was handled before might be acceptable or lead to a better idea. My name is Helen Alexander. I, I think that that's a really good point. I think it speaks to the way that we develop our housing programs. So right now, um, the housing that I said we built, you know, in 1983, the operating agreements for those units are all ending right now. So my responsibility um, around how I deliver that housing will then fall to our corporation and we get to make those decisions. So when we're handing out that money, we have to decide at the beginning who are we going to hand it out to, who's going to deliver that housing, and how are we going to ensure the longevity of that government intervention is going to actually last in our community. An example was that Mayor Helps was talking about the potential for them to donate land, but do it as a lease agreement so that the city would be able to maintain that land, and then when the lease agreement's over, they can decide how they're going to then re reinvest their, that investment into what is needed at that time. And so when we're, when we're developing these programs, we have to decide how and who we're going to give that investment to in order to make sure that those programs last long term. Because right now, we have a lot of operating agreements that are ending. How are we going to ensure that those are going to last in the long term? Thanks, Christine. Great. Sir, uh, just a question of clarification on the $90 million that you're speaking about. The 90, the $90 million in the region? Um, and, and then you said the average cost of putting up a multi uh, the, the average cost to put up a, a, a MERB is about two hundred fifty thousand dollars a unit. Uh, so that's forty five thousand per unit for two thousand units. And so that's one hundred and ninety five. So is this a seed money? Like it's not. It's 